Hey there, gang. It's Todd Nock, and it's time for another post-it note sketch. This time I'm drawing the Spider-Man villain, Green Goblin, on a 3-inch by 3-inch green post-it note. So uh, the Green Goblin can be a lot of fun to draw because his facial features are so exaggerated. He's got larger eyes, he's got a kind of a longer nose, a pointier chin, uh, a big crazy smile which pushes his cheeks up. He's kind of got a bit of a... Of a a jutting brow, so um, and then of course the pointy ears and uh, long pointy hat. So we're just going to start roughing in these facial features, and a character that has more exaggerated features can be really fun to draw because you get a lot more to play with. So um, uh, as we work through the uh, sketches uh, here, I'm also going to answer some of your questions that you've been posting on my different social networks. If you're on any of the social networks I'm on, swing by and give me a follow. They're all listed below: Instagram, Tumblr. Twitter, Facebook, they're all linked below, if not more. So uh, give those a look and give me a follow. So um, let's get uh, into some of the questions here, see what you have to say. So here on the YouTube channel, um, the Super Smeargle asks, did you instantly start pursuing a career in comic art, or were there other things that you had in mind? And did you teach yourself how to draw, or did you take certain classes or teaching lessons in doing so? Well, Smeargle, um, I, I've, I've always been drawing. My earliest memories are of drawing. I think I might have mentioned that in, uh, uh, in many of my other videos. So I've always loved to draw, always had a passion for drawing and superheroes. But as a kid, I, I, it was just my hobby. What I wanted to do was either be a, a veterinarian, an astronaut, a fireman, um, all sorts of different things. You know, when you're a little kid, you're trying to figure out what you want to do. Um, because grown-ups are always asking, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you got to have an answer because, you know, they, they, I guess they're looking for ideas as well. So um, I w started to settle in on acting by the time I was in junior high. I, I thought I wanted to be an actor, and I took um, after-school acting classes, which was a lot of fun. I, I enjoyed it. But by the time I got into eighth grade, I started reading comics. By the time I was in ninth grade, I started making my own mini-comics of my own characters. And that's when I realized I had a passion for comic books and I wanted to be a comic book artist so I started to teach myself how to draw comics. Um, I did teach myself a, lo a lot about drawing comics just by looking at my favorite comic book artists and creators and favorite comic books and just seeing how did they do this. And I grew up as a kid in the 80s so we didn't have the internet yet so I didn't have that resource to go to to look things up and I lived in a tiny East Texas town so there was no one I could really talk to about this so I just looked at my favorite comics and copied what they did. As I got into my high school classes, I was able, like in junior, senior year, I was able to take art as an elective and learn all, all sorts of different types of art. I went to the Art Institute of Dallas and studied commercial art and graphic design, never intending on being a commercial artist or graphic designer, but I was able to apply everything I learned there, my life drawing classes, my perspective classes, my design classes, any class I had there, I applied it to comic books. How can I use this information and apply it to the craft apply it to the career that I'm seeking to get into. And so that really helped get my skills uh, moving forward in a professional manner a lot faster. So uh, instead of just trying to teach myself on my own, which I had done all through high school and, and the year and a half after high school bef before I decided to go to the Art Institute. So going to the school, learning anything, anything you can learn about art, you can apply to what it is you want to do if you're creative enough to make that happen. Just give it a go. You might come up with something new. So that's why I'm always encouraging trial and error. Give something a shot, see what you learn from it, and see how you can apply it to what it is you're doing to maybe come up with something new. That's why I'm doing post-it note sketches. That's why I like to try doing a watercolor or Copic marker color illustrations. Just always trying new things because you never know what you might hit on. So I hope that answers your question there, Smeargle. I really appreciate you posting it. So now we're here on the inking stage, and as you can see, a lot of the thicker lines on, on Green Goblin are on the contours or the outer lines or the main shapes, and then coming in with thinner lines for some of the smaller details so that those smaller details don't have a, as thick of a line and it gets uh, muddied or confusing to the viewer. So you want to vary your line weights. You want to have thick lines to really... Uh, accentuate the shape of each aspect of the Green Goblin, from his hat to his brow to his nose to his cheeks to his ears, and then the finer lines, the, the, the wrinkles and cracks on his skin, the finer uh, inner workings of the, the, the curves inside the ear or um, the, the, the teeth or the, the, the smile lines, those might want to be a bit thinner so that there gives the eye more to play with. So keep that in mind when you're doing your inking. Vary the line weights 
Um, and also, keep in mind, uh, bold black areas give a lot for the eye to play with as well. That's why I like using the uh, pocket brush print pen because I can come in and put a bolder line or bolder graphic shape to um, create some depth and shadow as well. So over on Facebook, I had three people ask very similar questions. So we're going to tackle Jason Gutierrez, Michi Kahuya, and Black Haired Demon's questions because all three are very similar. They all asked... In, in one way or another, who or what inspires you in comics? What inspires you outside of comics? Let's see, the things that inspire me in comics, first off, the comic book art. I love seeing comic book art. I love the different styles and flavors that each artist can bring to uh, comic books in general, depending on the story, depending on the character, all sorts of different types of styles of art. So that can be a lot of fun. Uh, some of the earliest uh, inspirations for me personally as a young artist growing up in the 80s, uh, the 80s X-Men artist, Arthur Adams, Rick Leonardi, Walter Simonson, and Alan Davis. They were drawing some of my favorite X-Men comic books at that time as a kid. So that really inspired a young Todd Nock as an artist. Uh, this, this other things that inspire me in comics, I think, are stories that put you on a roller coaster of emotion, that have the light moments and the dark moments, that have the ups and the downs, that make you laugh with the characters and make you scared for the characters and make you care about the characters. These are the types of things that I, I like in my comics that I'm either reading or having a part of creating. So these would just be a couple of the things I could think of offhand that really inspire me inside of comics. Things that inspire me outside of comics, that's a really interesting question. Um, I would say um, They Might Be Giants. I love the music of They Might Be Giants, and they've actually inspired some of my creations just from some of their lyrics. Um, mystery Science Theater. I'm a huge Mystery Science Theater fan, and I have hidden little Mystery Science Theater-related uh, Easter eggs in, in all my comics over the past many, many years. So if you see a full uh, comic book I've done, there's a anywhere from one to eight Mystery Science Theater references, whether it's the letters MST3K on a, a license plate or a broken bit of a Mystery Science Theater robot amongst the rubble, maybe a shattered Tom Servo head, or, or things like that. Or even the names of episodes, the movies that they've done on their episodes, like Manos, The Hands of Fate, or Space Mutiny. You might see those written on the bookshelf, on the books on a bookshelf in a, in a character's library. So go back in the, the, the many comic books I've done from Young Justice, Spider-Man, Wild Guard, Nightcrawler. You might be able to find some Mystery Science Theater-related uh, Easter eggs in there. Um, and then just uh, anything else that really inspires me. My wife inspires me. Everyone says that uh, many of my female characters look like my wife. Well, she is my muse. She is the number one lady in my life, so... Um, and uh, she, she is very inspirational to me as well, and also a great support. So I'm very thankful for my wife and uh, how supportive she is of my art and lets me put in a lot of long hours to do what I do. So in that, in, in that regard, I'm very, very thankful and very blessed as well. So I hope this answers your questions as well, gang. I, I appreciate you asking those very similar questions. Uh, let's see, heading over to Instagram, underscore Chia Pet asks, what is the best advice you can give to any artist from inexperienced to professional? Let's see, Chia Pet, I would say my best advice would be to draw every day. If you want to be an artist, and if you want to get good at art, you need to be drawing something every day. It's not always easy, and you really have to carve out time to do it. It's a discipline you've got to develop if you want to pursue art as a career or to get better at your art. I really think you got to be drawing and practicing every day. And most every artist that you'll talk to in the comic book industry, if maybe not other artistic industries, will tell you the same thing. you got to practice. you got to put that pencil to paper. Every illustration you do is a step on your journey forward. If you're not drawing on a regular basis, you're not moving forward. You're not going to be able to grow and reach those levels that you're, you're wanting to achieve. So keep that in mind, drawing every day. And other things to consider is uh, draw from real life whenever possible. It's cool to be influenced by your favorite comic book artist. We all are. That's why we like comics so much. But also try to draw from real life. I think that will help one progress a little bit faster and discover new things about their art and their style as well. So let your style find you. And I think that really helps when we draw from real life more frequently. Um, and try new things. Try different types of art. Do pencil art, do pen and ink art, try marker art, try watercolor art, try oils or acrylics, whatever looks interesting, give it a go. Try. Trial and error. Don't be afraid of making mistakes. Put pencil, put lines down on paper, whether it would be pencil, pen, 
paint, whatever it takes, put those lines down on the paper and try. You, and be open to learning. Be open to learning from your experience on what you're doing. That's how I've achieved my coping skills, was just trying to put the, the, the ink down on the paper and seeing what I could learn. And it pr slowly progressed. If you look at my early Copic illustrations to my current ones, you'll see an evolution because I'm always working at it, trying new things, experimenting, trying new techniques, making up new techniques, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't work, and seeing what I can learn from those experiences. So uh, continued practice, continued trial and error. You never know what you're going to discover. But hopefully what you do discover is that your work is evolving and changing and growing. So don't get discouraged. Don't get too down on yourself. Just keep moving forward. Keep trying. Keep drawing every day. Can't stress that enough. Uh, I really appreciate the question there, Chia Pet. Uh, let's see what else we have here from Instagram. Benjamin Ling, too, asks, When you have a picture in your mind of what you want to draw, does that exact image transfer to the paper when you draw it, or does it turn out differently? This is a great uh, question, Benjamin Ling, because it's, I have experienced this. You know, I'll see the picture in my mind, and you know, it, it usually turns out very similarly to what I've pictured. Once I get drawing, sometimes I make changes, sometimes I tweak things in the process, in that sketching stage. Sometimes I see, as I'm putting it down on paper, something different uh, might work better as, as I'm, I'm putting the lines down. So I try to be flexible and free-flowing in that sense. To, be, to let the illustration take me where it wants to go. Sometimes I have just a kind of a ghost image of what it is I want to draw. I have a vague idea, and it doesn't really start to come into play until I start putting the lines down on the paper. So sometimes it's not always clear in my head. I have a, just kind of a ghost image idea of what it is. So um, I try to just really let, let the lines happen as they do and as they come out onto the paper and... and and make changes on the fly, or see what works, erase, try something else. If, you know, if I'm not liking how a certain arm or hand is placed, or a certain angle of the face, you know, that's the great state part of the uh, sketch stage, is that you can make these, choice, these choices and changes early on, before you've committed yourself, uh, once you get into the inks and color process, then you're locked in. So, really allowing yourself to, uh, to process what you're doing as you're doing the sketch stage and seeing what works best and taking a step back, looking at it and think, uh, maybe this leg is too short or maybe this arm should be uh, angled in a different way. Make those, th those are the great times to make those changes and decisions uh, in, in that easily changing stage of the sketch part where you can easily erase something, especially if you don't bear down too hard with a pencil and get that weird kind of that phantom image of the previously penciled section there. Um, but, you know, developing that light touch just does come with practice, so uh, you can get there with practice. Uh, just keep in mind to, to not bear down quite so hard. So I guess ultimately, to answer your question there, Benjamin, is that, uh, yeah, sometimes it turns out very close to what I want it to look uh, like in my head, and sometimes, you know, it, it will turn into something different. And it's really kind of fun when it turns into something different, because then it surprises me. And uh, that's kind of part of the fun of it as well. So I appreciate the question, man. And one more quick question from Facebook. Chris Short asks, who would be your dream team of writers and artists to collaborate with on a comic run? I've gotten to work with a lot of great writers, a lot of great inkers and colorists, so uh, I, I appreciate everything I've gotten to do with those people. So to work with someone I haven't worked with yet, I would say... Uh, Dan Slott and Edgar Delgado. Writer Dan Slott and colorist Edgar Delgado on Amazing Spider-Man would be a lot of fun to do. I love what they do on Spider-Man now. If I could get in there and draw one of their story arcs, that would be a lot, a lot of fun. Um, so many other great writers and colorists uh, out there that I'd want to work with as well. Almost too many to name. But I like working with new people because I'm going to learn new things. So uh, thank you so much for your question there, Chris. And I want to thank you all for posting your questions, whether it be here on YouTube or on my different social networks, all linked below. Thanks so much. We're wrapping up this illustration here. If you want to see the scan of it, check out the Facebook link below. You can take a peek at it uh, at the finished piece, and we'll be back with more videos to come.